Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the Torah studies this week, Parshas Boy. And um portion of Boy, of course, is talking about already the redemption, the final plagues where the Jewish people experienced so the Egyptian being plagued the last three plagues, and then ultimately coming out of exile, coming, coming out of Egypt, and being redeemed. And from, we're going to focus about the tenth plague today, the way the Torah describes it, and it gives us also the topic what, what this, of discussion. We're talking about the secret of survival. What is the secret of survival of the Jewish survival, a merger between human commitment and divine intervention. If you think about it, the survival of the Jewish people, you can't take this for granted. Many people gave different explanations. Why? What? what? It's a miracle. The fact that we are here today, it's a miracle. Nothing less than a miracle. But what is the secret of survival? That's, uh, you can have probably as many answers as uh, Jews. But we're going to focus today on what we learn from this week's Torah portion. And it is interesting what we see in the Torah. Sometimes we read the Torah, we read the stories. And we find more and more depth, what you can see in very simple words. And this is one of the cases is in this in uh, the case of the tenth plague that Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu to go to notify, notify Pharaoh about the plague. And he goes ahead and notifies him and he tells him when the plague, when the last plague will be, that it, it will happen at midnight. So I'm going to look inside, and then we're going to see how amazing the words of the Torah that we sometimes just overlook. Okay, so to what do we attribute the amazing phenomenon of Jewish survival over so many years? Despite the upheaval, expulsion, genocide, tragedies, and persecution, we have suffered. So in the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu goes and he says to Pharaoh, he says, Vayem Moshe, and Moses said, so said God. At midnight, I will go out into Egypt. And he tells Moses, says to Pharaoh, that this will happen at midnight. And the question is, why? Why does he have to tell him when it will happen? That it will happen exactly at midnight. In the other plagues, we don't find it, except there's two other plagues that he tells him it's going to be tomorrow. Doesn't tell him exact time. In the case of the hail, we see that God did uh, mention. God did mention um, that it, should, it will be exactly today, uh, to, tomorrow, at the same time. And why? There is a reason. Because we know that the plagues were there to tell Pharaoh, to show them that it is God. And when it came to the hail, the, the plague of the hail, we find, as we see in the next text, let's see inside. It says, Hashem, uh, Moses says to Pharaoh, that's what Hashem says, Hinani mamtir ka'et. Barat kaved me'od. 
At this time tomorrow, I will rain very heavy hail. So I will say this, tell us what exactly happened. I will say this, tell us exactly what happened. He said, he hatched a line on the wall and said, tomorrow when the sunlight, re sunlight reaches this point, hail will begin to fall. So he told, he told them exactly when it will happen. But why did he do it? He did it because there was a reason. God told him to tell the Egyptians that if you want to be saved from the hail, make sure not to stay in the field. You got to go home. Go inside. Whoever went inside was saved. That, is, that was the reason he told him. He made a, a hatch, I made a scratch in the, on the wall. And it says, exactly, you see the sun is right here. Tomorrow, exactly that second when the sun reaches that point, that's when the hail started. That's when the hail will start. So this had a reason why he told him exact, the exact time. As we see it in the next text, it says in the Torah, part of the warning of this plague, it says as follows, Now send for and gather your livestock and all you have in the field. Any person or beast found in the field and not brought into the house will perish in the falling hail. Okay? So there, we know a reason why Moses told Pharaoh the exact time when the hail is coming. But when it comes to the last plague, the plague of the firstborn, what's the point of telling him exactly when it will happen? No one was able to save himself from the plague. No one was able to save himself from the plague. So that's number one. So unlike with the plague of hail providing the Egyptians with the time of the plague, the, the time of the plague of, of uh, the firstborn was useless because A, they wouldn't protect themselves anyway, and B, most Egyptians could not accurately pinpoint when midnight was. Even back, back in those days, okay, back in those days, they would, uh, how would they tell the time? They would have uh, the sun uh, clock, all, all, but at night, midnight, most Egyptians would not be able to tell when midnight is, even if they would be able to save themselves. But either way, it's, so number one, they couldn't save themselves. Number two, no, no one, most of them at least, could not tell exactly when midnight is. When exactly when the exact time is moreover if the egyptians needed to know the time it would have been useless to them without knowing the date <laughs> that's another interesting question at the other plagues he tells them the date he tells them tomorrow it's going to happen tomorrow but at the plague of the last plague when he told when he told them what we just read before that at midnight God is going to come. But mid midnight when? Today, tomorrow, next week? He didn't, tell, he didn't tell him exactly when it will happen. So obviously, there must be something different, something special, something, another meaning to the words of this message when he tells him what, what exactly it means by midnight. What is the message here? As the Ebenezer says, it is well known that even then an expert requires sophisticated timepieces to pinpoint midday precisely. Midnight is even more difficult to pinpoint. So, obviously there must be something lying beneath this whole story. God executed the final plague himself and not through a messenger. The plague being exactly at midnight highlighted this because only God 
can accurate, accurately pinpoint the moment of midnight. If you remember, if you read the Haggadah Passover night, we read the following text. We know the other plagues was done by angels, Moses raising the hand, throwing the, the earth, and so all kind of things. The plague of the firstborn death was was executed by God Himself, nobody else. And that's what we read in the Haggadah. In the Haggadah and Passover night, we read this. It says, And I will pass through the land of Egypt on this night. It's a quote from the Exodus, from the Torah. So we say in the Haggadah, I am not an angel. I will strike every firstborn in the land of Egypt. And again in the Haggadah we read, I am not a Saraf. Saraf is another level angel. I will strike all the idols of Egypt. I am not a messenger. I am God. I it will be I and none other. So the question is, why was it so critical that it it would be God? that does this this last plague and no no one else why was it so critical that not an angel angel would do the plague of the, the tenth plague and the answer is because when god appoints an angel to do a mission an angel is created and that angel does the mission that it was appointed to do when God gives permission to kill, to destroy, then there might be a danger that the killing, the destruction can be indiscriminate. Once then, if, if an angel is given permission to destroy, the danger is that the destruction can come also to the Jewish people. And why is that? Because the truth of the matter is, our sages tell us that at that time, Jews were also sinning. They were immersed in the idolatry of the Egyptians. And therefore, when it came to punish, the Egyptians, if the angel would have done it, it would have killed not only the Egyptians, it would have killed the Jews also. That is why God wanted to make sure that this plague, he does it by himself. So no Jews should be killed. This is from the Medrash. Once the destroyer is given license to destroy, it does not discriminate between good and bad. But not only it doesn't discriminate between good and bad, it was something that at that point, the Jewish people also deserved to be killed in, in, in that sense. We do find a, a, a Zohar that talks about after the Jews left Egypt and they came to the ocean, they came to the sea, and the miracle happened there, the famous miracle, the splitting of the sea. So there were angels who could not understand this, and they claimed and they complained to Hashem, why do you do miracles to the Jewish people? You're going to split the sea, you're going to let the G Egyptian die, and the Jewish people live, they're both worshipping idols. What's the difference? This is from the Zohar. It says, when the Israelite neared the sea and God intended to split this, the, the, Red, the Red Sea for them, Rahav, the Egyptian guardian angel, complained to God. He said, Master of the Universe, whose ways are all just and proper. Why do you intend to punish the Egyptians and split the sea for the Israelites? Both nations are guilty. These 
worshipped stars and, and planets, and those worship stars and planets. So it's not just that the destroying angel would do so indiscriminately, but he actually had a reason. He had a reason to destroy the Jewish people. And that is why Hashem didn't want this to happen. And for that reason, Hashem did it on his own. He said, this plague, this tenth plague, I'm going to make sure on my own. And I'm going to make sure those, the not the victims, but the perpetrators, they will be punished. But the question is, what's the difference between the last plague and the first nine plagues? The Egyptians went through many different plagues. And the answer is that the character of the plagues, the first nine plagues, is different than the last ones. The first nine plagues, it came for a purpose. What was the purpose? It was to show the Egyptians that I am God. There's many different way plagues. He plagued the, 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 the river to turn into blood because that was their uh, idol. They worshipped the river because that what gave them sustenance and so on. Every plague was another way of proving to the Egyptians that there is a God. But that the Jewish people didn't need. The Jews were believers all along, although they also worshipped idols because they were involved with the Egyptian culture, but their faith in God, really deep inside, never went away. So the last plague was a plague of punishment. Punishing for what they did. What they did, worshipping idols, Jews also did. The first nine plagues was about proving that there is God, and that the Jews know. So despite their foray into paganism, the Jews never abandoned their faith in God. Thus, they were not required to experience the first nine plagues. And that's what the Alter Rebbe says in Torah Or. In the, and, uh, it says the Jews did not require proof, for they were believers, children of believers. As the verse states, and the nation believed and heard that God had redeemed. So even in the most difficult times when they suffered so horrifically, Moshe Rabbeinu came and told them, I was sent by Hashem to tell you that your time of redemption has arrived. What does the Torah say? And the Jewish people believed. And they heard that Hashem has remembered them to redeem them. So that's the answer. So why was it so critical that God do this plague on his own? Number one, is God executed the final plague because if he had given the angels the authority to kill, they would have done so indiscriminately, resulting in the death of many Jews as Jews and Egyptians were equally deserving of punishment because they, after all, they all worshipped idols. And why was it so, and, and, and another answer, why was it so critical? God pardoned the Jews from the ten plague out of love. Since only God has the power to pardon, He has to be the one to administer the final plague. You see, because when it came at that point, they thought, the Egyptians thought, that, you know, in that sense, when it comes to punishing them, to eliminate them, they thought that they are equal like the Jewish people. And that's why they felt safe, basically holding the Jews hostage was like an insurance policy, just like today in the Hamas, they take the hold the hostages and they feel that this protects them because they're going to bomb them. They're not going to bomb the 
the Jews. So the Egyptians also thought that way. They thought we're going to hold the, the Jews here. God is not going to punish us and eliminate us for worshiping the idols because the Jews do the same. So as long as we hold them, then we're good. And they fail to understand that Hashem has a very accurate way of, of pinpointing, as we'll soon see. Pinpointing and understanding who deserves to be punished and who not. There is the inner inherent love that Hashem has to the Jew. And for that reason, Hashem pinpointed and made sure to separate that the plague goes only to those who deserve to die. And that is why he did not do it through an angel. He wanted to do it on his own. And there's an interesting mess, uh, teaching from the Shiloh Kadesh. It says, we read in the Torah, it says, Vayareyu oisonu amitzrim. The, the, the Mitzrim, the Egyptians, have dealt bad to us. Literally, the meaning means that the Egyptians did bad things to us. But the Shiloh Kodesh says, the word Vayareyu oisonu, Vayareyu means not only they did bad to us, but they made us bad. They are the ones whose fault was it that the Jews were became idol worshippers and became, the, the culture, the pressure that they they got the pressure from the Egyptians from their uh, uh, subordinates to get in, involved in those things. So the fact that the Jews worshipped idols is not really their fault; it is the Egyptians' fault. So this is so this is the message. That is why Hashem needed to do it on his home. So due to his intense love for the Jews, God went against all logic and pardoned them. And Moses revealed the timing of the final plague, midnight, to convey that God himself would be executing this plague, as only God can precisely determine the moment of midnight. Only Hashem can determine exactly when midnight is. So that was the message when Moshe Rabbeinu is telling Pharaoh, at midnight, you are going to be plagued. It's not about telling him what night and what time it's going to be. It is about telling him who is the one who is going to execute this last plague, the punishment for the Egyptians. It is the one God who only he is able to pinpoint the exact precise moment of midnight. You know, when the... As the... We find in the Madrashas, can any human determine the precise midpoint mid of the night? Only he who knows his times and moments can split the night. So only Hashem is able to do that. And that's what the Rebbe says also in the Sikha. He says, splitting the night. It's not a time. It's not about telling him what time it's going to happen. It is an action. Kachatzot alayla means as, as the night will be split. Moreover, this action does not occur over a span of time. It happens at a precise point in time. The point that splits the two halves of the night is not a measurable unit of time. If it were measurable, it too would have been divisible. If you're saying this moment, this minute is going to happen, it's, it's not midnight. It has, that moment can also be divisible. The first half would belong to the first part of the night, and the second half would belong to the second part of the night. This is the message inherent in the words that Moshe Rabbeinu says to Pharaoh 
as the night splits at midnight, I will go out, God would go out at the precise indivisible point. When the night would split, because only God knows his time and moments. Okay? So, 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 so far we understand. That is why. That this is the message. That is why Moses says to Pharaoh that this plague, plague is not just a regular plague. It's going to come by God himself. And that is why that is the message in saying it's going to happen at midnight, at exact midnight. Who can determine when is midnight? When is the exact precise nuclear moment of midnight? Only Hashem can determine it. And that is the message. But the question is, it's still it's still not answered. The, the th- truth is. This is true at any moment of time. Could be midday, could be at sunrise, could be at sunset. That also, any moment of time cannot be split by humans. So question, why did the time have to be midnight? It had to be an infinitesimal indivisible point of time it's a new word for me meaning a very very small moment of time but these points occur at every moment of the day so again what's what's the idea of god and moses telling pharaoh at midnight if you want to say that god can split the moment any moment it's not just midnight 10 o'clock in the morning also god split the moment between the moment before 10 o'clock and the moment after 10 o'clock so what's the point of midnight? So that needs further clarification. Question number four. Why didn't Moses just come out and tell Pharaoh that God would deliver the plague himself? Why did he intimate it by, in, by informing Pharaoh that the plague would occur precisely at midnight? Okay, so again, that's a very simple question. If Moses wants to teach Pharaoh to tell him that this plague is going to happen by God and not by an angel, so why don't say so? Why don't you say so? Moses could simply say, Mr. Pharaoh, this plague is going to happen by God himself, not by an angel. There must be a message here in the fact that he tells him that this plague is going to be, but the one who can separate between the midnight. So here are the questions, and again, we're going to come to a very interesting and deep understanding what this message teaches us. And the point of the answer is that when we're talking about midnight, in the Kabbalah it says that midnight has a very, very special power. Midnight is a time that is between first half of the night and the second half of the night. First half of the night in the Kabbalah, it says it's connected more with the concept of gevura, restriction, restriction, judgment. And this is why the first half of the night, it gets darker and darker and darker. The second half of the night, represents the chesed, the kindness. That's when the light starts, it's getting lighter. The darkness of the night changes at midnight. And we're not talking about 12 a.m., talking about midnight is goes in, in, in the Jewish calendar, it goes every day, shifts a little bit. But the point when the, when the night, the mid of the night, is so important. Now, it is not just that this is a point that is shifting from from gevura, from judgment, into kindness. The point is that in order to have this shift and this combination, a point, a moment that connects the first the, the first half of the night and the second half of the night, 
is a mo is a po is a point that comes from us from a power that is above and beyond both. I mean, just to illustrate, if you have if you have two children arguing with each other, each one sees their own thing, their own view, and each one is a hundred percent convinced that he's right or she is right. But sometimes the parent sees it from above, sees both points, and is able to combine them both. So in Kabbalah it talks about it a lot, about the fact that in order to combine two opposites, you need to have such a power that is not limited to these two forces. And that is the point where Hashem says, it's going to happen at midnight. Midnight represents that point of godliness which combines such a power which is above both. And therefore, that power can be used as both a punishment to the Egyptians and at the same time a saving for the Jewish people. The same power. That it goes beyond our understanding. Let's see inside. It says in the prophet Isaiah, it says, V'nogav Hashem es Mitzrayim nogav v'rofa. God shall plague Egypt, plaguing and healing. And they shall return to the Lord, and he shall accept their prayer and heal them. So you can learn and understand this as, yes, you're going to plague the Egyptians, and then the Jews will repent, and God will heal them. But the Zohar explains, no. The Zohar explains that the same power that plagues, that is exactly the same power that heals. It is the same God, the same godly power. Omar Rabbi Yaisi, Rabbi Yaisi said, the very act that struck the Egyptians brought mercy upon the Jews. It was a plague for the Egyptians and a healing for the Jews. So the plague of the death of the firstborn came from a transcendental point from which opposites emerge, kindness and severity. And in order to do this, as the Rebbe explains, it needs to come from a higher source. A source where kindness and severity both are the same. This, this single act consisted of kindness and, sev and severity simultaneously revealed kindness and generosity towards the Jews and, str and stricture and justice toward the Egyptian. Only a power that transcends both poles can accomplish this. And the Rebbe goes on to explain. It says, this explains why the plague of the firstborn had to be at the point of midnight. The first half of the night is dominated by stricture. This is why the darkness grows stronger as the moments pass. The second half of the night is dominated by lenience. This is why the night begins to grow lighter each moment. In other words, the paradigm of night is the interplay of opposites. It is an interplay of opposites. The point of mid of midnight combines the opposite poles lenience and stricture because this point transcends the entire paradigm of the night. One would merge one who merges opposites must transcend the limitations of both. And that's exactly the answer. So the point of midnight is transcend, transcendental. It combines severity and leniency. It is a generic point from which both emerge. 
The plague of the firstborn was a transcendental miracle. It makes sense that a transcendental God would perform a transcendental miracle at a transcendental point in time. That's why midnight is known to a very special, to be a very special time. It's called midnight. It's called Eight Ratzon, a special time of will and Bei Hashem. There's many prayers throughout history. Jews would pray at midnight. Now the question is: Is this okay that God is doing it for the Jewish people? Why? Because He loves them. We understand that. But is just a gift that God decides? Okay, I want to gift my. I love my children, and I want to gift them. And the answer is that this was really a two-way street. What do I mean? What caused the revelation of that deep love that Hashem showed, the essential love that He had to the Jewish people? It was, it was triggered by a deep devotion of the Jewish people. So although they were involved in all kind of idol idolatry, they were part of the, Jew, the Egyptian culture, but deep, deep inside, they always had the faith. They always have the emuna. But more than that, at that night, what did they do? The, the Jewish people. At that night when God came to kill all the firstborn of the Egyptians, the Jewish people put blood on the doorpost. What was the blood? It was the blood of the Passover offering, the sacrifice, and the blood of the circumcision. They were all circumcised that night. Because one who is not circumcised was not allowed to eat from the Pas Passover, the Paschal offer offering. These two bloods that put on the on the on the doorposts, they represent they represent the total illogical connection that the Jew has with Hashem. Why? Because the Paschal offering was what? This was the Egyptian idol. The Jews was supposed to take risk their lives and taking the Egyptian idol and slaughter it. Not only slaughter it, four days in advance, they would tie it to their beds. And the Egyptian would ask them, what is this? And they would say, yes, we are going to bring this as an offering to God. That was a very tremendous sacrifice and risking their lives. That represents... We have, uh, you know, we have, it represents the keeping of the prohibitions. Meaning, we have in the Torah, we have uh, 365 negative commandments, prohibitions, and 248 positive commandments. These two bloods represent these two types of commandments. The Paschal offering represents removal from the negative, from the idolatry. And the blood of the circumcision represents their commitment to circumcise themselves for what? For God. Even babies, which don't understand anything. A Jew is circumcised by eight days before the baby has any understanding. Because their connection to Hashem goes beyond logic. And because they did this sacrifice, with these two types of bloods, that triggered, that elicited God's deep love to them. And this is the secret of the Jewish survival. So let's see inside. So informing Pharaoh that the plague would take place at midnight, not only guaranteed that God would deliver the plague, but also revealed God's intention to achieve 
the seemingly impossible using transcendental midnight powers to ensure the survival of the Jews and the Egyptians' demise. So this is a writing by Rabbi Moshe Alshich that explains what we just said. He said, God gave our ancestors two commandments, the blood of the Paschal Lamb and the blood of the circumcision. They were equally in need of both, for they had worshipped an Egyptian, the Egyptian sheep, as is well known. A person who worships idolatry must self-rectify in two ways. One is to purge impurities. The other is to enter the sphere of holiness. This is the idea of avoiding wickedness and embracing goodness. So their impurities were purged by the Paschal Lamb because they slaughtered the very sheep that they had once worshipped. As the Torah says, draw, draw and take. Mishchu, ukhu. Withdraw your hands from idolatry and take the Paschal Lamb. But yet, more was needed. After purging the impurities, they needed to accept the yoke of, of, of the true God. This was accomplished by the mark of circumcision, the sacred signature of God, which is our initiation into servitude to God. So these are the two commandments that God gave them. But this was only because the true faith was still there. They had the ultimate faith. The Jews' logic-defying faith in God and devotion to God, even to the point of self-sacrifice, elicited God's reciprocal love. So we started by the class asking about what is the secret of Jewish survival? And that is it. The secret of Jewish survival is this two-way street that we have with Hashem. Despite the suffering, the miracle that we are here today, it is because no matter what, what we do, no matter what we feel on the surface, deep inside, we do feel connected. And that sometimes that connection comes out under extreme circumstances. You see in the war in Gaza, when the soldiers go with uh, people from backgrounds, totally not religious backgrounds. And what do they want? What do they need? They want the tzitzis, they want the tefillin, they want the blessings. They want people to pray for them, they want to pray with people. We see that deep emunah, that deep connection with Hashem that comes out under extreme circumstances. There's a writing by Rabbi Yaakov Emden of the 16th, 16th uh, century. He writes about this miracle. First comes uh, from the Medrash here. It says, the only merit by which our ancestors were redeemed from Egypt was the faith, as it is written, and the nation believed. Writes Rabbi Yaakov Emden as follows. We are the exiled nation, the lost sheep. With all the troubles that have passed over us through the millennia, no nation in the world has been persecuted as we have been. How numerous our enemies have been from our earliest days. How mighty have they filled, have they lifted their hands, seeking to destroy and uproot us because of hatred. 
caused by envy. But they have been unable to destroy us, all the mighty ancient nations. Their memory is gone. Their hope is not. Their protection has been removed. But we who cling to God are all alive today. How can a sharp skeptic rebut this? Could it have been the work of chance that caused all this? By my living soul, when I contemplate these wonders, they seem greater to me than all the wonders and miracles that God did for our ancestors in Egypt, in the wilderness, and in the land of Israel. And the longer the exile continues, the more this miracle is verified, and the more we know its power and might. So what's the conclusion? that this is the secret. It is not just that Hashem loves us, and that is why we survive, but it is the dual relationship between us and God. We commit to Hashem, and that in turn triggers also Hashem, Hashem's love to us. And my man, it is right in the, in the Guide for the Perplexed, he writes, for as the new heavens, it's a, it's a quote from the Isaiah, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make remain before me, says God, so will your seed and your name remain. In some instances, the seed remains, but the name perishes. Many people are undoubtedly the seed of the Persians or the Greeks, but are no longer known by that name. They were assimilated into other nations. I believe this is a prophecy that our Torah, which gives us our unique identity, will remain forever. That this, this, what the prophet Isaiah says, that your seeds and your name will remain, this is what it means. It's not just that the seeds of the Jewish people will remain, but also the name. We are all together by the name with the children of Hashem. There's a story told by... Uh, a guy named Mr. Yosef Friedman. He has his wife's great grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. His name was Yosel Freidenson. Yosel Freidenson was born in Lodz in Poland. And as a teenager, he studied in the famous yeshiva, Chachme Lublin. And then he ended up in the Warsaw Ghetto. And in our, and and then in Auschwitz. So, Mr. Friedman relates the story. He once was sitting with his uh, wife's uh, grandfather, and he was sitting at a Shabbos table. They're singing Hasidic melodies from from back from those days. And then suddenly, Mr. Friedenson says, "I just remember the story that I never told anyone." And he said that in the camp, in the ghetto, in the concentration camp, there was a Hasidic Jew, a Hasidic Jew named Meilach Rubinson. Meilach Rubinson, every Moitzah Shabbos, he would make, in the concentration camp, he would make a Malava Malka. And what's a Malava Malka? We know a Malava Malka is a mitzvah to eat just like we have a mitzvah to eat three meals during the Shabbos. There's also a mitzvah after Shabbos is out, when it goes out, Saturday night, we're supposed to sit down and put the candles with a meal 
we tell stories and we sing Nigunim. So he, in the concentration camp, Meilach Rubinson, would make him a lava malka every Mertzah Shabbos. But there was no food. So he wouldn't eat food. It would make him a lava malka with Nigunim, with singing melodies. And it says, what the melody they would sing, there is a famous melody, uh, the famous words, different melodies to that words. Omar Hashem le Yaakov, al tira of the Yaakov. Hashem says to Yaakov, do not be afraid, my servant Yaakov. We sing it, Omar Hashem le Yaakov. Al tira of the Yaakov. There's different, different, different melodies to the song. Omar Hashem le Yaakov. So it's a very emotional song. Talking about the Shem saying to Yaakov, do not be afraid. Generally we do it. Shabbos is a time of holiness. We live in a bright time. We live in good time, holy time. And then we enter Saturday night. We enter to the weekday, which is scary. Darkness, coldness spiritual cold, coldness but he's singing this in the concentration camp and you can only imagine the people around him they're singing this was like a joke singing about don't be afraid we're going to be safe look the germans are winning we're being killed we're being, being destroyed but he said but this jew with his singing and faith he gave strength says uh, Yosel Freidenson, he says this, this Meilach Rubinson gave us strength and gave us hope. And we had tears running, not bitter tears, but tears of hope. Tears that told the story of our people through thousands of years of pain and sufferings. And yet we are all still here. So that's the, the story he told. And the next day, he was supposed to go give a lecture in Rockland County, New York. It was before Tisha B'Av was supposed to give a lecture about the Holocaust. So his uh, gra uh, grandson-in-law, Yossi Friedman, told him, you're going to talk to them. Tell them this story that you just told us, but don't just tell them. Sing it with them. Sing the song to them. And that's what he did the next day. And he sang that song. People were crying when they heard the song. But then two people got up from the crowd and they walked over to him and they told him, Mr. Fredenson, we are the grandchildren of Meilach Robinson. We never heard that story before. Thank you for sharing that story with us. So the Jewish survival, we survive because we are connected with Hashem. We do our things, we do the mitzvahs, do what we need to do. Sometimes we go beyond the logic. And when we go beyond the logic, it triggers Hashem's love to us, an open, revealed love beyond the logic. So that to conclude with the points, what we learned. So the plague of the firstborn was a combination of opposites. The very act that punished the Egyptians, pardoned the Jews. Simultaneously, severity and kindness. Point number two, we're talking about midnight. Midnight is an infinitesimal, indivisible point in time that contains both halves of the night. The half that dominates, that is dominated by severity and darkness, and the half that is dominated by kindness and light. Simultaneous severity and kindness. Number three, to emerge opposites, you must transcend both. Only God can accomplish this. And only He can pinpoint the precise point of midnight. This is why the plague of the firstborn occurred precisely at midnight. And point number four, had God not delivered this plague himself, 
many Jews would have died that night. This is because many Jews dabbled in paganism and idol worship while in Egypt. Point number five, though Jews did not deserve to be saved that night, they did elicit their salvation. How? Their logic-defying faith in the devotion in, and devotion to God, even to the point of self-sacrifice, elicited God's reciprocal love. And finally, point number six, the secret of Jewish survival is a partnership between God and the Jews, the God and the Jewish people. The survival of our seed is God's miracle. The survival of our creed is our contribution, and it elicits God's miracle. So thank you for joining tonight. And any comments, any questions, any stories you want to share, this is the time you can do this.